Well, good morning, Valley family. Uh, happy Memorial Day weekend uh, to everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we are actually concluding this series we've been in since week after Easter. It's week number six uh, in our Good Medicine series. Before I jump in, though, I uh, want to invite you back for next week uh, as we kick off that brand new series called Origin. We're going to be starting next week all the way through Labor Day weekend looking at the, the key figures and stories in the Old Testament, starting in Genesis, working our way through, uh, kind of give that big picture panoramic view of the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes, not all the time, but, but sometimes folks uh, see the Old Testament as like, well, that's not really about us, you know, kind of disconnected from us, uh, you know, kind of in the New Testament, Jesus and all that. But the reality is the Old Testament gives us so much more clarity when we read it through the New Testament. And that's what we're going to be doing uh, beginning next week because uh, our faith has an origin. And that's what we're going to be looking at, our origin stories. Uh, so I invite you back for that next week. And also just... Uh, I want to just say special thanks. It is Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we have members in our church that literally lost siblings uh, in service to our country. And uh, we, we are eternally grateful uh, just to have the freedom that reality is we probably take for granted uh, in, in our nation today. Uh, Susie and I, my wife Susie and I, we've been to some places uh, in, this in this world rather, where we don't have freedom. Uh, really to worship the way that we would want to. In fact, our sister church in Transnistria, when we first met them, uh, they every Sunday would have to bake cakes and they had little tables and chairs and that when they had their services, they would have a cake at every single table. And the reason for that was when the KGB would bust in because they weren't allowed to have religious services, they'd say, what are you doing? We're celebrating a birthday. Okay, and whose birthday was it? Well, it was Jesus' birthday. They celebrate it every single week uh, in order to kind of like fly under the radar like that. Hard for them to do that now. They've got like, I think, 700 people in their church, uh, but God's just given them a lot of grace. But uh, we never want to take for granted that freedom that we have just to gather in, in a place like this today and, and to worship the one who really set us free. So I think it'd be appropriate. Uh, let's just give a hand for all those that paid the old <laughs> sacrifice for us. All right, well, uh, I, I thought about the finale of this message today, and uh, a couple weeks ago, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, um, pretty much whatever you see on our website in terms of the sermon notes, that's about all that I have up here with me, and uh, I shoot from the hip a good bit, and uh, I, I started kind of like uh, just uh, shooting from the hip on the subject of the difference between sympathy and empathy, and it seemed like it really connected with people. And I was like, you know what? I want to circle back around to it. I think there's something more there, uh, really, than, than maybe we realize. And that's what I want to talk about today. I'm entitling this message, A Seat at the Table. A Seat at the Table. And, and one of the things that I, I love the most uh, about our church, I love a lot about our church. I love pretty much everything about our church. Uh, and I'm completely subjective when I say that. Uh, but I love the name Valley. I love the name Valley. Because, you, you know, real vegetation takes place not on the mountaintop, it's in the valley. The fruit is found in the valley, not on a mountaintop. Mountaintop experiences are great, but you can't live on a mountaintop. You, they're, they're, you can't sustain life on a mountaintop. It has to be down the valley. Down the valley is where the fruit is. Down the valley is where the vegetation is. It's also, you know, kind of an analogy oftentimes of a negative thing, the valley Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But I, I hope, if nothing else, through this series, over these last six weeks, realize that God has a purpose even in our pain. Even in the valley, even in the difficult times, God wants to use them for our good. And we've talked a lot about that over the last five weeks. And today, I, I want to uh, kind of look at a story that, that to me is the, the epitome, like probably... The, the best example of what empathy really is and what empathy really looks like in the Bible. And, and, and it may be a, a little surprise of how it really connects with you and me, and I believe it does connect with you and me, or should connect with you and me every single day. The word sympathy, sympathy, the best definition of sympathy is understanding someone else's suffering. 
Like, I'm, I'm sorry you're suffering. I'm sorry you went through that. But empathy is very interesting. It comes from German language. And the word empathy literally means feeling into someone else. Feeling into someone else. Feeling into what they're going through. Feeling into what they're experiencing. Empathy ultimately means experiencing someone else's feelings. And I want to drop in on a story that's recorded for us in the Old Testament. It's, it kind of plays out in a number of different chapters. So I, I want to hit the high points and then kind of get to the meat of the story. But, but the, the backdrop, kind of the prequel to where we're going to be, is in 1 Samuel chapter 20. King David has been anointed as the next king over Israel. And there is a current king named Saul. And Saul has a son named Jonathan. And Jonathan and David end up being incredibly close friends. And things are, David's on the run. He's, he's hiding for his life from Saul who's trying to kill him. And then the tide begins to turn. And, and the reality is Saul, Saul and Jonathan begin to be hunted. And in 1 Samuel chapter 20, Sam, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 20, David and Jonathan meet up together because they're friends and they realize this is probably the last time they're ever going to see each other. And Jonathan knows, he's like, David, I know you're the next king. It's not going to be me. He was, Jonathan was the heir. Jonathan should have been the king. But he knows David's going to be the king. And he says, I, I, I know you're going to be the next king and I want you to make me a promise. Just, just be kind to my family. Because in those days when one monarch was replaced with another monarch, they would literally wipe out all of their family and relatives. And so Jonathan knew that not only he, but his, his own kids as well were on the chopping block. And so David makes him this promise in 1 Samuel chapter 20. And he says, I will show goodness to, to your family. Whatever's left when this is over, I will show goodness to them. And so they say goodbye to each other and they never see each other again because Saul and Jonathan are slain and David becomes the king. And not unlike governmental leaders in our day, everyone's wondering if the guy who now is sitting in the big chair is going to keep the promises that got him there. All the promises that were made. Is he going to remember what he said he was actually going to do? Or now that he's got the power, is he just going to use the power however he wants to? And so here's David now, the king over all Israel. And the question is, is he going to remember the promise that he made to Jonathan? I will show goodness to your family. And that's where we want to drop in on the story. And we find it in 2 Samuel chapter 9. But before we go there, I want to introduce a character to you. And if we can put his name up on the screen, his name is Mephibosheth. 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 Now, here's the thing. I want you to have empathy on me today because I have to say Mephibosheth about 57 times in this message. So what I want us all to do is I want us all to say it together. How about that? So you can feel my pain. So on the count of three, all right, let's just say Mephibosheth together. One, Two, three. Oh, you guys are so much better than those nine o'clock crowd people. They were like, they, they tried to pull a fast one. They're like, uh -huh. you know, like that. They, just one more time. Let me hear one, two, three. Mephibosheth. I went to 12 years of graduate school so I could pronounce that. Uh, Mephibosheth. Now, let's look at the story of Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son that David is going to show unusual kindness to. In fact, empathy towards. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? I, I love that. Uh, David's like, I'm not doing this for Saul. I, I'm not doing this. Just I'm doing this to keep the promise that I made to my friend Jonathan. And so he asked his servants, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And, and then we dive into the story. And in this story, I, I want to share with you three ways to convey empathy. Three ways that David does it. 
and three ways that you and I can actually convey not just sympathy, but actually empathy. And what we're going to find is Jesus talks about for his followers, you and me, he wants you and I to show empathy, not just sympathy, empathy to those around us. So three ways to convey empathy. Here's the first one. Empathy is showing kindness to someone who cannot return the favor. Really, really important. Empathy is showing kindness to someone. They can't do it back. It's not, I'm going to do this for you so that one day you do something for me. That's not empathy. That's not what God really wants from you and from me. Empathy is showing kindness to someone who can't return the favor. Back to the story, 2 Samuel chapter 9, beginning in verse 3. The king asked once again, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? And then Ziba, Ziba is one of David's servants. Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he, the king asked. Ziba answered, he's in the house of Mekar, son of Emiel in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar. It's interesting, uh, we're going to find, especially next week, when we start in Genesis, uh, the Hebrew language, Hebrew that the Old Testament was largely written in, is very different than Greek, Koine Greek, in the New Testament written in Greek. Greek is a very technical, it's a very specific, it's a very precise language. Hebrew is not that. Hebrew, in fact, is, is much more, it's not a vague and general language, but Hebrew is a picturesque language. And so the names of things, when you, when you read the Old Testament, the names of things, they seem very uh, whatever to us, but in Hebrew it's like, no, there's something more happening than just what you think the name of that city is or the name of that area is. So case in point right here, Mephibosheth is in Lodabar. Lodabar is a village, is a town, but in Hebrew, it actually means no vegetation. No vegetation. Now think about this for just a minute. Mephibosheth is the grandson of King Saul. He's in the royal family. And he's living in a place of futility. He's literally scrounging for food. There's no vegetation. There's, no, there, there's nothing but futility, frustration, and lack. And not only that, he's completely crippled. He should be in the palace, but instead he's a pauper, living in poverty. There's one left, and he lives in Lodabar. He lives in a place of total futility and frustration. No vegetation. Second, going backwards to find out, uh, back in time to find out what happened to uh, Melphibosheth. In 2 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, it tells us how he became crippled. 2 Samuel 4, 4, it says, Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was lame in both feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came to Jezreel. So he was perfectly healthy for the first five years of his life. And it's on the day that the word comes that his grandfather Saul, who is the king, and his father Jonathan, who is the heir, that they're about to be overthrown. They're running for their lives. And Meher, um, I'm sorry, uh, Mephibosheth is five years old. And it says, his nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell and became disabled. His name was Melphibosheth. Some paraphrases of, in English of this passage just says, he's a cripple. But the key to this whole story is that David is described in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. And we're going to see how David responds to Melphibosheth. And not only is it going to be a great, warm and fuzzy story, but it's going to show us something about how God responds to you and responds to me. And how he wants us to respond to those around us. 
as well. Back to Melphibosheth walking in here to the palace, or rather being brought in, he couldn't walk. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 7, Do not be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show, show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. He invites him in and he says, you are going to live in the palace with me. This is the grandson of Saul. This should be his enemy, his sworn enemy. It goes on and says in verse 8, Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Think about this. This is just just mind-blowing. This should be the sworn enemy. Mephibosheth is crippled as a result of running and hiding for his life. He's lame. There's there's no hope of a cure. He's living in Lodabar, this place of frustration, futility, just no vegetation, scrounging for food. The servant of the king shows up. What do you think, if you're Melphibosheth, what do you think when you hear the hoofbeats of the servant of King David outside your home? This is not going to be a good day. This is probably going to be your last day. But instead, the king's servant says, come with me. The king wants to talk with you. They bring him in, and he says, from now on, you're going to eat at my table, and I'm going to restore everything to you that should be yours as an heir in this kingdom. I, I don't know what King David's, you know, dinner table looked like. I kind of imagine something like this. Can you just imagine for a minute? Melphibosheth is like, what? What? From low to bar, no vegetation, no fruit, scrounging, scared, futility, to this. And he's sitting there with King David's own children. And David really treats him as if he is one of his own children. See, sympathy says, Mephibosheth, I'm, I'm really sorry that you can't walk like everyone else. I, I, I'm just sorry. Empathy says, Mephibosheth, I'm going to walk with you. And I'm going to take care of you for the rest of your life. Big difference between sympathy and empathy. I've heard it put this way before. Empathy is the language that the deaf can hear and the blind can see. That's what empathy is. And it's so fascinating to me that Jesus had a lot to say about what motivates you and I to show kindness to other people. Do you know you can do an act of kindness for the wrong reason and it actually becomes the wrong thing? If our motivation isn't actually right. Jesus talked about, let's look at it. Luke chapter 14, verse 12. Jesus is at a great banquet one day. And look at what he says. He gives instruction to you and I as his followers. Luke chapter 14, verse 12, it says, Then Jesus said to the host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. He's like, when you're giving a big party or a big banquet, it's not about invite the right people so they invite you to their party, you know, later on. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. What he's saying there is, God will repay you. God will repay you. What does that mean? We can't have a party with our friends and family? No, it's not meaning that at all. But what, what Jesus is actually drilling down into, he's, he's there at this banquet, and he realizes that everyone there at that banquet was invited for one of two reasons. And that's what he's drilling down, and that's what he's really uncovering. 
They were either invited to that banquet as a payback because the host had been invited to their banquet at some point or to kind of grease the skids to to make it so that there was a debt that now they owed the host that one day he would collect upon. And what Jesus is saying is like, listen, pagans relate to people like this. Atheists, the ungodly, this is how they treat one another. My servants are not supposed to treat them, treat people that way. My followers are not supposed to treat people that way. It's not, you know, Jesus is saying, the way you're supposed to treat others as a follower of mine is not, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But a bing, but a boom. That's not the way it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be, I cannot deny any request made of me on the day of my daughter's wedding. But one day I will come to you, perhaps, and ask you to do a service for me. That's the mafia, y'all. That's not Christians. But we do this too much. We serve with a hook. We sacrifice with a hook. What's in it for me? I'll do this as long as you remember I'm doing this because sometime later I'm going to ask for a favor from you. And Jesus says, that's not kindness. That's manipulation. That's not Christ-like. That's the kingdom of this world. That's not the way my followers should treat one another or treat anyone. That's why he says, when you're going to, if you want to make sure that you're doing it right, if you're going to have a big banquet, you invite the crippled, the blind, the lame, those that cannot do anything to repay you, then you'll know your motivation is truly right. Check your motivation. What's really going on in your heart? Because true empathy is shown to those who cannot really repay or there's never a repayment even expected. That's what true empathy really is. Our modern world is so competitive and it's easy for God's people to become more concerned about profit and loss than about sacrifice and service. Jesus said, I'm all about sacrifice and service. Because you can sacrifice and you can serve and you know what? My heavenly father will see it all and he'll reward you one day. And it'll be greater than any reward in this that this world has to offer. We have to strive as followers of Jesus based on his words, not only these but many, many more to actually sacrifice and serve in an unselfish attitude when we help others. The second way that empathy is really shown is empathy is following through on God's promptings. Empathy is following through on God's promptings. Think about it for just a minute. Let's go back to, if we could, that picture uh, of just an imaginary picture of of the the table in the palace there. If you know a little bit more about David's family, you'll know that Right there, Mephibosheth is there, and he's eating day after day with Absalom the bold. Tamar, David's daughter, Tamar the beautiful, Solomon the brilliant, and there's Mephibosheth the broken, right there with all David's kids treated as one equal when he's actually the grandson of Saul. I like to just imagine there's a tablecloth over the table. That tablecloth is a tablecloth of grace that covers over Melphibosheth's legs and his feet so that as he sits there, because of David's goodness, he's an equal with those who otherwise would call him an enemy. That's empathy. I've been praying uh, this week for a church family, and I pray that, that this week that we're even more sensitive maybe than ever to the promptings of the Holy Spirit as we go about our business. 
that, that when the Holy Spirit gives us those little nudges and says, go up and talk to that person. You see that person in the cafeteria sitting by themselves, that new person? Invite them to come sit with you. Go out of your way. When, when, you, when you recognize a coworker that it just doesn't seem like they've got that shine they normally have, are you doing okay? Is everything all right? I'm just praying that we'll, we'll follow through with those Holy Spirit nudges and show compassion and show empathy. In fact, I, I just pray that, that when the Holy Spirit does nudge you this week, that these three words will just come to your mind. Just do it. Just do it. Don't think about it. Don't rationalize it. Don't wonder what are, what are everyone else going to think about me. Just do it. Just do it as God is leading you to. And show empathy and care and compassion for those that God brings across your path. The third thing that, that empathy really conveys, that we can convey empathy, is empathy, em, empathy is comforting others with the comfort that Christ has given you. Pain allows us to be equipped to comfort other people. The pain that you've experienced, it, it uniquely equips you to be able to bring comfort to those that need it the most. Have you ever wondered... Why was David so empathetic to Jonathan's son? Why was David so empathetic to Melphibosheth? I think it was because David knew what it felt like to be overlooked. David had been overlooked in a major way in his life. Some of you know the story. God spoke to the prophet Samuel and said, go to Jesse's household. I, I'm going to take the kingdom away from Saul because of some sin that he's committed. And I'm going to give it to one of Jesse's sons. He's going to be the next king. And so when, when Samuel came to Jesse's house, he said, do you have some sons? He goes, oh, I've got quite a few sons. He said, line them up. I want to take a look at them. And so they all came in. Samuel's looking at them. God doesn't say any one of them is the next heir the next monarch in Israel. Samuel turns to Jesse and he goes, is that it? Is that the only son you have? Those are all the sons? He's like, well, yeah, there's that old David out there. He, he's tending the sheep. Samuel says, send him in. I want to see him. And here comes David. Now, a couple of things culturally that, that you may... Um, pass by you when you read that story about David that are really significant details of that story. The first is this. Jesse was a wealthy man. He had many, many sons, and he had sheep. He owned sheep. Very wealthy man. No wealthy sheep owner would ever have one of his children tending the sheep. Something right there is like red flags waving like, why, if David's the son of Jesse, why is he out there tending the sheep? Not only that, you know from the rest of the story that one time he killed a bear, one time he killed a lion. That's the reason why you don't have your boy out there. You have servants to do that. Why is David out there tending sheep? When David walks in, God speaks to Samuel and says, he's the one. He's the one that's going to be the next king over Israel. In all of the Bible, think about this for just a minute, David's mother is never mentioned. Her name is never mentioned anywhere. It's not recorded anywhere in the Bible. Why? Don't you think if you were starting a new monarchy that, that you would mention Jesse was the father and his mother was, there's no name. Because most scholars believe that David was Jesse's son, but from a mistress or a prostitute. He didn't have the same mother as the other sons did. That's why Jesse had him out in the field. That's why Jesse treated him like he was a hired hand, a servant. That's why Jesse overlooked him. David knew what it felt like to be overlooked. When David hears 
of the overlooked son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth. He says, bring him to me. And when they bring Mephibosheth to David, David loved Mephibosheth with a greater love than he had ever experienced from his own father in his lifetime. He said, I'm not going to keep you on the outside. I want you right at my table. You're just like my own flesh and blood. David knew the sting of being rejected. David knew the sting, the heartache of being overlooked. And he showed out of that pain that he personally experienced, he showed Mephibosheth the love that he did not deserve. It's a powerful story. Empathy is comforting others with the comfort that Christ has given to you. In the series, we've looked at this passage. I just want to circle back around to it one more time. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 4. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our, all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. In the middle of your pain, God is making you into a great comforter for those who will be going through pain in the future. That's how we can show true empathy, not by forgetting what we've gone through, but by remembering what God's brought us through so that we can show great empathy to those who need it most, just like Mephibosheth. See, your past enables you to help others in this present moment. This is what the scripture instructs us as followers in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ Jesus. I, I love this statement. Empathy is when your pain lives in my heart. That's what empathy is. That's what David experienced. David experienced Melphibosheth's pain living in his own heart. And that's why he said, no longer will you be in lack. No longer will you be in want. Now when you think about it, that day Melphibosheth, lame, no hope for ever walking. He received so much. If I had to boil it down, I'd say probably there's three things that he, he received that day. The first, he received a new place. He was now living in the palace. He was in a place of low to bar, no vegetation. Now he's living in the palace. Second thing is, he received a new provision. Basically, David's saying, everything I have is yours. You have access to it all. I'm not withholding any good thing from you. It all belongs to you now. The third thing he received was a new parent. David treated him as it was his own flesh and blood. So much Mephibosheth experienced and received that day. And you know, I know a story like this is like, wow, that must be, I, I can't imagine if something like that happened to me. That'd be so cool if, if, if me, some king said, come on in, have a seat at my table. I would love if something like that happened to me. It did through Jesus Christ. You see, in this story, David is really a type of our heavenly father. And the servant that David sent is just like a servant, the son of God, Jesus Christ, who lived a sinless life, and laid that life down as a sacrifice and a substitute for you and for me and rose again three days later. And because of Jesus' sinless life, and his sacrificial death, and his resurrection from the dead, you and I receive a new place. This earth is not our home. We're just passing through. But you want to talk about a palace? Wait till heaven, and you see the place that he's preparing for us. Because of Jesus, you receive a new place 
heaven. You receive a new provision. The Bible says a cattle on a thousand hills belongs to God. He owns it all. There's no need. There's no lack. He will be the provider that we need. No longer living in low debar, a place of futility and frustration, but instead a place of fruitfulness and enjoying all that God has for us. A new place, a new provision, and a new parent. God's not angry with you. God's not upset with you. He wants to be your father. He wants to love you perfectly and tenderly as a heavenly father. All of that is ours because of Jesus Christ. And if you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, that is what you come to, a place at the table. The book of Revelation talks about the great banquet that we will enjoy in heaven at the king's table that he's prepared for us. You are Melphibosheth. I am Melphibosheth, crippled by my own sin and brokenness. You're crippled by your own sin and brokenness as well. But God sent his ser servant, his son, to bring us back to him. And this is our heritage. This is our inheritance. He's given you, he's given me a place at the table. I'm going to ask right now, would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the love and the compassion and the empathy that we see through David. Just a glimpse from his heart of what your heart is for each and every one of us. And Father, I do pray, Lord, that this week that every one of us would be sensitive to the promptings of your Holy Spirit when, when, when you nudge us in the direction of someone to show kindness and compassion and concern and empathy towards. Lord, may we do that recognizing that we really are your hands extended. Father, thank you for this great, inspiring story of David and Melphibosheth. And Lord, we're reminded you've made a place for us at your table and you've given us a new provision and Father, may we respond and relate to you as a new parent, the loving Heavenly Father that you want to show yourself strong to for each and every one of us, Lord, both today and in the days to come. Thank you, Father. Right now, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want to give an opportunity to anyone, to everyone here today, if you've never prayed and received Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, to receive this offer of forgiveness and salvation and eternal life that God makes to us, just like David made that offer to Melphibosheth to live in his palace. The Bible says if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So right now where you are, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or to stand up or anything like that. I just want to lead you in a prayer that you can repeat after me, even in a whisper, right where you are. This is between you and God today. And so I just invite you, if you've never opened up your heart to receive Jesus as your Savior, to do it now in this moment and repeat this prayer after me right where you are. Just say, Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. I turn from my sin today. Jesus, thank you for living for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for rising from the dead for me. And Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and I receive you as my Savior today. I ask you to lead me and guide me by your Holy Spirit from this day forward. Amen. Amen. And now, if you'd like to receive this blessing that I'm honored to speak over you, I just uh, invite you to open your hands like you're receiving a gift from God 
because these words that I'm honored to speak over you right now truly are a gift that he gave. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and may he give you his peace. God bless you, Valley family. Have a great Memorial Day.